So how do these maps look? I mean, the color scheme and style are distinct. The lighting, shadows, and post-processing look great. This is a complete map, right? That's what I thought a few months ago. But unknown to me, I would go on a very extensive journey to discover what a truly good map looked like. In this video, I'll share this journey with you. Because of the sheer amount of stuff I have to talk about, I'm going to split the video into four sections. I'll start by talking about the problems with my previous maps. Then I'll talk about major factors that play into making good maps. In the third section, I'll talk about how I was able to actually create these maps. And I'll end the video off with a little B-roll, which I hope I get right because I'm still working on my editing skills. Before we start, one more thing. I will be a little vague about some things because they will relate heavily to the story of the game. The next devlog will be an introduction for the story that I've been working on, and for that reason, I won't disclose a lot of things in this video. For the longest time, I thought my maps were great. This was because, as an early, premature game dev, the only thing I cared about was graphics. I never took a more technical look at my maps, and that was very evident. Luckily for me, a lot of the issues with my maps were outlined very well by you guys. The first problem were the colors. Despite the white and blue combination looking great, it was definitely hard on the eyes. As a player, it would begin to actually get annoying and boring to continually play with that color scheme. The second problem was that the maps weren't very interactable. Even though they looked good, I had provided little incentive for the player to explore the maps thoroughly. A lot of the maps were just visual and had very little solid gameplay in them. The third problem was the lack of movement in the maps. If the player stood still, the only movement was the slight wind in the trees and grass. Besides that, the maps were completely dead. So with my biggest problems clarified, I decided to look into what makes a good map. I did a bit of research and looked at what actually makes an enjoyable map. I came across a couple of very important concepts. Making your maps feel almost infinitely large makes the experience just that more immersive. You can actually make an infinite level with procedural generation, and you can also load certain parts of your map at a time, similarly to chunk loading in Minecraft. I've already covered this topic in my optimization devlog which you can check out on the channel. Another tip is that you need to switch up the style from time to time. Having just hours of gameplay on say my white and blue maps is going to get boring very quickly. Because of this, I have created indoor maps with light and dark schemes, I've been working on a very low poly sci-fi black and blue scheme, and I've obviously kept the previous white and blue. I also want to create different vibes. For example, I plan on creating industrial sectors, simple areas that will relate to the story, human-based settlements, and environmental areas. As a developer, you naturally want to create an incentive for the player to completely explore areas of your map. For example, it would be a waste if the player walked through this map in a straight line. I've solved this problem in two ways. Firstly, I've intentionally planned to hide loot all over the maps, some of which you'll have to spend time searching for. This loot will be very important in buying upgrades and unlocking new weapons. I've also created a door system that I will talk about later. In order to create an immersive experience, the player needs to be able to interact with a lot of things. This could be destruction when the player shoots something, the ability to equip weapons, opening doors, looting crates, interacting with screens, etc. After establishing the problems with my maps and what I needed to do, I got straight to work. The first thing was detail. If we go a few months back, my maps felt increasingly empty. The problem was that I was using solid colors like grey, white, and black, with some emissive materials. This meant that the maps were very plain. I couldn't use textured materials because they stretch really weirdly. Also, if I didn't stretch it but just copy-pasted cubes, it would take an immense amount of time and would be very unflexible when making maps. Because I'm using the built-in render pipeline, I also have limited access to shaders. I could download a basic version of the shader graph from URP from the package manager, but I found that tutorials were limited on that. Instead, I added detail by spamming random props everywhere until it looked good. There were several problems with this. Firstly, having so many assets lying around would make optimization an absolute pain. If I made them static and combined them into one mesh using the free mesh combiner asset, then I would cut into the rule of having interactable immersive maps. I needed a way to quickly and easily add detail to my maps. My solution was to use a triplanar grid shader for my floors. Although this sounds simple, 
it made a massive difference. I don't know if you can tell in the video, but the maps just instantly feel fuller and more detailed. This way, I can continue to make my maps with this grid acting as a boost in complexity. This shader also means that I won't have random areas of the map that feel empty and incomplete. Now, I'm not sure, but as far as I can tell, you can get volumetric lights in the built-in render pipeline. You can obviously fake them with textures like how it's done in games like Punker, but I personally don't like how they look as much. I was able to find this free plugin that provides you with a script that can turn light sources into volumetric lights during runtime. I'll leave a link in the description to the video where I found this. The video shows a step-by-step -step process to set it up, which involves adding a rendering script to the camera and a volumetric script to the light source. Using this, I began creating light sources that I could throw around my maps. Having different colors also looks really good, so you can do that by simply changing the color of the light source. The next thing I did was create an interaction system. Now, I did previously have an interaction system. The problem was that it was terrible and wasn't flexible at all. The way it worked was by shooting a raycast that would hit an interactable object. Then, based on the tag of the object, it would display a certain text like E to equip or E to interact. Then, when the player presses E, the interaction script would run a specific function. The problem was that with my plan to create hundreds of interactable items, having different tags for all of them would be annoying and time consuming. Instead, as I should have from the beginning, I created a bunch of variables like the type of object, the text to display, the interaction key, etc. This made setting up and creating interactable objects very easy. The way my new interaction system works is that it uses a raycast to see if there is an interactable object based on whether or not the tag is interactable. Then it references a script attached to the object that determines the letter and prompt for interaction, as well as the type of interactable it is. This entire process runs in real time, meaning that setting up an interactable is as easy as a few clicks. To make my life easier, I've also organized all my prefabs, meaning that they were all ready and just need to be placed in a scene. Finally, finding and using assets can speed up and help you develop maps, especially if you're an indie game dev. You can find assets for different styles and aspects of map development. I revamped the loot crates and created additional interactables like buying stations, dialogue, equipping weapons, workstations, ship consoles, a door system, etc. The door system was actually very important for a big project that I'll show off at the end of this video. I decided to create a very comprehensive door system that would help with the flow of levels. For the doors, they can easily switch between doors that open at the presence of the player or doors that need to be opened with the power sources. I've also been working on some destruction. Although I don't need to create a very complex destruction system, I want the player to at least feel like their bullets have an impact on more than just the enemies. It would also allow for the player to create their own desirable paths through levels. The destruction system is still a work in progress as of now. I also found this really cool AI by Blockade Labs that actually generates skyboxes based on the prompt. Although I haven't actually used one of its generated skyboxes in a scene yet, it's definitely really good at making skyboxes. It has several different art styles as well. Here are some of my generated skyboxes. I wanted to make solid progress on the actual gameplay loop and leave the basic fundamentals prototyping state I'd been in previously. To do this, I made arguably the most important map in the game, the player's base.
So that's the player's base. I've put a lot of space in for the interaction like healing pods, a hollow table for missions, boarding, storage, equipping weapons, etc. The actual functionality isn't there yet, but it will be added to the base while the actual systems are developed. I'm also currently working on a Discord server, I hope to get that out to you guys by the next video. So that's it for this devlog, hope you enjoyed, and feel free to leave any comments you have in the comment section.